chief economist at the CII. He runs a corporate and economic consulting firm called CERG Advisory and serves on the boards of major listed companies. Both these gentlemen will be chatting up with our moderator, Gurcharan Das. Hi, sir. Mr. Gurcharan Das, his latest book, India Grows at Night, is a liberal case for a strong state, and it was at the FT's Best Books for 2013. He's also the ed he's currently editing for Penguin, the story of Indian businesses in 15 volumes, of which nine have appeared. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a Tales of Trade. Jerry Rao, Omkar Goswami, and Gurcharan Das. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, underwear. I'm not going to ask you how many of you are not wearing underwear. But what I'm going to tell you is this book, our, this one of the volumes in our series, East India Company, tells us that the world started wearing underwear after they discovered Indian, fine Indian cotton. Before that, the, in Europe, they either wore wool, they had wool or coarse cotton. And it was the discovery of fine cotton from India via the East India Company that made the aristocracy first start wearing underwear and then the rest of the people followed, and after they followed, came with modernity, the rest of the world followed. If you had stood in the South Indian port of Kerala, it was called Musavis, during the time of the Roman Empire. It's close to Kochi. One ship from Rome landed there every day. And in the Roman Senate, the Roman Senator Pliny, he got up and he told the Roman Senators, stop wearing those white togas. Go home and tell your wives not to cook with Indian spices and stop, and stop using Indian luxuries because Rome was losing 65% of its gold, of its bullion, to India every year. Now, that story is told in the world of the Tamil merchant. And a few years ago, you may remember that we, we read in the papers about Padmanabha's treasure, the treasure we found in that temple in near Trivandrum. And, well, how, what, it, what they found were the gold coins from the Roman times. They found coins from the days of the Dutch East India Company, the English East India Company, the Portuguese, and many more before that, along with other treasures. And all this really is to tell you that India was a great seafaring nation with a 5,000-mile coastline. We have created this series to tell the story of the romance of the bazaar, the romance of the high seas, and really to celebrate the, the classical notion of artha. Something, frankly, that in the days between, 19, between the years between 1950 and 1991, our socialist license Raj, something we had forgotten and something that we were embarrassed about. I'll quickly tell you, going to the next one, well, 
the next one volume is the Arth Shastra. And the Arth Shastra advice given to the king in the Arth Shastra is be careful. Do not tax your people too high. This means the farmers or the merchants. They said that unlike China, where the emperor owns the land, here you have a share, and your share is sat bhaga, one sixth. And therefore, the just tax rate is 15%, which is, of course, the tax rate today of Singapore. That's the just tax rate. I think we should tell that to Mr. Jetley. <laughs> the mouse merchant. Right now, we're getting stuck between one of our computers. Right. <laughs> Then this volume, the author of this, I should be mentioning the names of the authors of all these volumes, uh, that before I forget. Tom, Trou uh, Tom Troutman is the greatest scholar of uh, Arth Shastra, wrote this. Kanak Lata Mukund from the South wrote The Mer World of the Tamil Merchant. Tir Thankar Roy from London School of Economics wrote East India Company. Now. The person who wrote this is actually from Bangalore. Unfortunately, she's not here. Arshia Satar. And the mouse merchant, the story of the mouse merchant is truly, let me get up, because this is, is truly a fun story. There's a poor boy, he's 13 years old. And his mother works in houses like a maid but he's from a merchant family and they've become impoverished. So she tells the boy, go and wait outside at the house of the richest man in our town. The boy goes there and he finds a dead mouse in the courtyard of that house. When the merchant comes out, he asks the merchant, can I have this mouse? And the merchant has a big laugh. And he says, of course, you're doing me a favor. But look, why are you asking me something? People come and ask me about so many other things. Don't you want anything else? And the boy says, no, thank you. So the boy takes the dead mouse, goes to his neighbor, who's a woman with a cat, and he sells the mouse as cat food. And from the few paisa she gives him, he goes and buys chana in the market. With the chana and water, he goes to the main square of the town and waits until the afternoon. Loggers come from the forest carrying logs of wood. And so he asks, offers chana and pani to each one. And they're very happy that somebody's there. And they're so happy, they, ca they have no money, so they each give him one log. So he takes this log, and the next day he sells one log and buys more chana. And this goes on for a couple of months. By now his house is full of logs. And so the rainy season, the monsoons come, logging stops, price in the market shoots up, in the timber market shoots up. And this guy starts unloading his logs, and he makes a fortune, a killing, and he buys a shop in the timber market with that money. Then he, after a w working as a timber merchant, he realizes there's a not enough margin in trade. So the big money, he says, is in shipbuilding. So he wants to become a shipbuilder. So he gets a partner who knows building of ships, and so he becomes a ship a, a, a shipbuilder, and then he runs his, he gets a captain to run his ship, and pretty soon he has become the richest man in town. Then he has a gold mouse made, and he goes to, the to that rich man, and he presents the gold mouse of 24 carats to this rich man, and he tells him his story. And the merchant is so happy that he gives his daughter in marriage to this boy. 
So that's the story of the of un, since Bangalore is synonymous with startups and entrepreneurship. This is a story for our times. So that's the mouse merchant. Very quickly, <coughs> um, I was going to tell you another story from here, but I think time is short. I'll go jump across to, you know, 64 countries did the same reforms that India did. But why did India become the second fastest growing economy and now the fastest growing economy in the world? Now, after demonetization, we may not be the fastest growing, but we are the fastest growing economy in the world. Well, I have a politically incorrect answer. And that is it's because of our traditions, our vaishyas, our banyas, our, our traditions of merchant families. And so this is a volume on the Marwadis, written by Tom Timberg, who wrote his Harvard PhD thesis on the Marwadis. And there is only one story that I want to tell you from this very quickly. And the, this is the story of 23-year-old man who was supporting nine people in one room in Calcutta for 13 rupees a month was the rent for the room in Calcutta. And this boy, his mother would tell him, go and get a job. No. What was in, he was a Marwadi, he, what he had in his blood was money. Whatever money he used to get, he used to use in silver speculation on the London market. So he put all the family fortunes into the silver market and the market crashed. So now they were finished. And he couldn't even go to the Bada Bazaar because, you know, his, he was persona non grata. If you default in, in those circles on your loans, you are finished. But so he's come down and out in the world. But he has one friend who's an astrologer, a rich astrologer. He goes to him. And he takes him by his neck. And he says, you told me that I would one day be a very rich man. Look at me today. What happened to your astrology? You are a very bad forecaster of my life. And the astrologer said, let me look at your hand. And he says, no, no, I'm sorry, but you're going to be a very rich man. And the fellow says, he says, look, you're, you're talking nonsense. And he's about to leave. And he says, by the way, I've got a tip. The silver market is going to go up. Why don't you put some money in the silver market? The fellow says, okay. He's a rich man. How much do you want to put? 10,000 rupees. 10,000 rupees in those days was equal to 10,000 pounds. There was one-to-one -one ratio in at that time. And so he puts 10,000 pounds. He doesn't have money to send a telegram. So he's, the fellow, he asks the man, give me the money to send the telegram to London. And at the same time, give me money to take a tram to the CTO. He doesn't have money to take the tram. But he does it. Next day, the market goes down <laughs> further. <laughs> so this fellow's money is in trouble. But that fellow... Uh, the astrologer sends him his, uh, his servant and says, look, look, sorry, you, you, I don't, uh, I don't want to do this trade. But the fellow says, it's done. We sent the telegram. Now you can't get out of it. I'm sorry, sorry. That money, that problem now is yours. You are in the hole for 10,000 pounds. This fellow is completely shattered. Then suddenly, in the next few days, the market starts to rise, silver market. He hasn't done the clearing. So that bet is still on. 
So immediately that 10,000 pounds has become 50,000 pounds within one week. So he clears that, then puts whatever money he gets back, back into the market. He's after all a speculator. Anyway, the long and short of it is within three weeks, he has one, become one of the richest men in the world. I'm telling the story of Mr. Dalmia. The fortunes of the Dalmia started with this 23-year-old man who, who went on. You know, the rest of his life is also very colorful. For that, you should have come for the erotica session that we had earlier in the day. <laughs> Anyway, now let me uh, quickly end here. Um, Scott Levy, Caravans. This, if you were standing at Khyber Pass one March morning, you'd see 20,000 camels laden with Indian goods, cottons, luxuries, slaves, many kinds. They were all headed on the Silk Road across the Khyber Pass, across the Hindu Kush, across on one side to Central Asia, on the other side towards, uh, uh, to via Iran, Isfahan, to Astrakhan in Russia, up the Volga, up to Moscow. That's where, and these were Punjabi Khatri merchants who did this trade. And they established caravan sarais all over. And they were very highly respected because they represented a substantial revenue of their government that, that this trade represented. The only thing that bothered the people of these countries about these Hindu traders was the fact that you know, they didn't mind they're celebrating Diwali and they're celebrating all the other festivals. But when somebody died, they had to cremate the body. And when the smoke rose from the body, these people thought they were ghosts going up. And they got very worried and very restive. And that's why they needed police. In fact, they needed the whole army to protect this festival. Okay. I think it's time now I want to introduce you to two people who have written uh, our most recent books, eight and nine in the series. This one, uh, Globalization Before Its Time, the Gujarati merchant from Kutch, the Kutchi merchant. Now you know the Kutchis through Azim Premji. He's a kachi. And so these guys did a fantastic golden triangle trade that Jerry will talk about. It's written by Chaya Goswami, and Jerry has edited, brilliantly edited this book. And our latest is Omkar Goswami, Goras and Desis, which is about the managing agencies and the making of corporate India. So let me sit down now, and let me ask let me begin our, the latest volume with Omkar, and then Jerry will talk for about seven to 10 minutes each, and then we'll have a little conversation. Thanks, Gucharan. I mean, you're a damn good raconteur. Uh, so let me, uh, if you, I'm not talking of the Ambani uh, or companies that <coughs> set up after liberalization in 1991. But if you were looking at the history of long-standing companies, so say, for instance, uh, if you were looking at EIB Parry, if you were looking at Binnie's, if you were looking at Buckingham and Carnatic made here, or Tata Sons, which has become so important, uh, or Birla Brothers, virtually, I wouldn't even say virtually, there, no company in India no large business house in India started without the framework of having a managing agent. And let me explain what 
a managing agency was. In a country where a lot of people had money, some were very good traders, but few were entrepreneurs in the sense of putting in money for factories and making of goods, but lots of money, people figured out, and I'll tell you who figured it out first shortly, people figured out that a great way of, and this was also a time when there were, the, there were banks, but banks didn't give long-term loans. So people figured out uh, that the best way of starting a company would be that you would float a company if you were worthy of respect as a managing agent. So if you were an Andrew Yule or a Bird and Company in Calcutta or a McNeil or a Barry or any of the Octavius Steele, famous Jardines Henderson, then you would you could float a company. It could be a jute mill. It could be a tea plantation. It could be a colliery. Uh, in Bombay, it would be cotton mills. Uh, and the power and prestige, more than power, the prestige of the managing agency, which a person called Lokanathan called the imprimatur of a managing agency, was enough to ensure that there would be a lots and lots of shareholders who would come in, and with relatively small ownership, often as less as 15%, sometimes even less than that, you could actually control the company because if you had 15% ownership and the rest was all small shareholders who were only too eager to punt on a company that you were setting up, then you could control the company even with 15%. And so, so let me give an example and I'll give more of it a little later. Tata Iron and Steel was floated by Tata Sons. Tata Sons was already a name to reckon with. It was not by the time of uh, it not, Jamshedji Tata had died, Sir Ratan Tata had floated it, not this Sir Ratan Tata, the previous Sir Ratan Tata, and, and, and Dorab Tata. And, and, uh, and when you floated, when, when they floated it, no one would even question. Now what would happen thereafter in the first AGM of the company, the company would appoint the managing agent as the managing agent of the company, formally, and the shareholders would vote for it. So it would be that Tata Iron and Steel's managing agent would be Tata Sons, for which they would take a certain percentage of sales, a certain percentage of profit. The next resolution would be that supplying of key managerial personnel for Tata Iron and Steel would come from Tata Sons. So if you remember, there was a time when you had Tata Administrative Services, which supplied people to the Tata companies, for which a fee would come to the managing agency. The inward trade would be to another company floated by them. The export would be through an export house of theirs. The uh, hiring of labor would be through a labor contracting company of theirs, all of which would give you fees. So you would actually end up through a large set of companies that you floated, a lot of money from various interlocking amounts, which would be significantly greater than the dividend that you would earn in times of profits from your shareholders. And at a time when capital was relatively scarce because term lending was not available and, and stock markets were very good. The Bombay Stock Exchange, by the way, is the second oldest stock exchange in Asia. The only one older than that was two years earlier in Tokyo. Okay. So the stock markets worked very well. Uh, banks were not going to give you long-term capital. So what these guys did is that they would set up a large number of companies using their A, goodwill, and B, their name in the market, and get much more than you would get as an investor in the company. All you would get is dividends, they would get much more. They would get dividends plus plus, okay? And the system was called a managing agency because they were managing the affairs of these companies through Tata Sons, for instance, as Tata Sons is doing very much now, right? 
So, but, and you would think this kind of a system had to have been thought of by the British. And you would be wrong. It was not thought of by the British. It was thought of by one of the canniest entrepreneurs in the first half of the 19th century. And his name was Dwarkanath Tagore. He is the grandfather of Rabindranath Tagore. Dwarkanath was a very, very big zamindar, had lots of zamindari revenues. He was also very much into opium and indigo trade. And he decided, he found out, that this was the time when steamships had started. Steamships needed what? They needed coal. Coal was found near Asansol in West Bengal in the Raniganj coal field, and he could buy it at a very low price. But there's no point having coal in Raniganj if I can't get it to Calcutta, because the, the ships would dock in the Hooghly for, for uh, getting their food, their replenishments, and everything else. So how would you ship the coal? You needed barges. So he bought the coal mines. He, bought the, he created a company which bought, where shareholders bought into the Rani Ganj Coal Company. Then he created the Bengal Steam Navigation Company for the barges. And one after the other, he kept on floating companies. These two were spectacularly successful. Others were failures, including a spectacular failure was a, the failure of the Union Bank. But he created a system which everyone realized was such a clever system, it was the managing agency system. Soon enough, both in Bombay and in Calcutta, the Brit, uh, not, not so much in Bombay, in Calcutta, the British took over. And there was, there was jute to be made out of raw jute to make jute cloth. There were pla tea plantations because Already Assam tea was proven and Darjeeling tea was being uh, very much wanted over and above China tea. And there were collieries as well. So companies like Andrew Yule, very famous companies, Andrew Yule, Bird, Hyger, Thomas Duff, Jardine Skinner, each of them, you know, you, I can name them ad, in ad nauseum. Each of them had 10, 12, 15, 25 companies under their wings in which they were managing agencies and they controlled it. Bombay was different. Calcutta was a very, very white city, very white. And, and after all, till Curzon, it was the imperial capital. So it was an extremely white city. Bombay always was a totally cosmopolitan city, much, much, much more cosmopolitan that any Bengali would have you believe, okay? Uh, and it was a city in which entrepreneurship thrived. So in Bombay, you had Parsi, you had Gujaratis, you had Kachi Memans, you had Daudi Boras, you had, you, you name it, you, 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 you had uh, Baghdadi Jews. So how many of you are familiar with Bombay? Kasun Docks is named after a Baghdadi Jew family which had seven cotton mills as well as a huge amount of prime real estate, right? So, but all of them, all of them used the form of managing agency. In Calcutta, in Calcutta this was challenged in 1921 by a young man who turned out later to be one of the most brilliant businessmen that India ever had. He was a young man then, and he decided he's going to start a jute mill. And his name was Ghansham Das Birla. And, and then the Marwari started coming into Calcutta, following Birla. And so by the time we got into independence, I'll take a couple of minutes and see. Uh, by the time we got into independence, there was a large number of Marwadis also in the horizon in Calcutta. Bombay, anyway, was largely run by Indian-run managing agencies. However, over time, this idea of having many companies under you, some on an upswing, some on a downswing, where I could take money from A and give to B, X, Y, Z, do risk aversion, all of that became relatively less important 
because of five reasons. One, you had the Industrial Development and Regulation Act in 1951, which licensed things. You had the Industrial Policy Resolution, which reserved things for specifically for the government. You had, third, the setting up of the development finance institutions, ICICI, IFCI, IDBI, which then gave long-term loans. So if I could get long-term loans from very pliant bankers who were only happy to help you because you were well-connected and never wanted to actually collect your money if you were in difficult times, you could always gold plate a project and you didn't need managing agencies for your cash flow. And finally, there was a political issue. There were two terrible scandals. One scandal involving a guy called Haridas Mundra. A scandal, by the way, uh, you can read it in the book, but the scandal is one that made Piroz Gandhi a famous figure in parliament because he stood up against his father-in-law and he forced Jawaharlal Nehru to actually sack P.P. Krishnamachari, who was the finance minister, because there was a shenanigan with life insurance companies' money. And the other was the gentleman that he talked about, Ramakrishna Dalmia. Ramakrishna Dalmia was, at one level, an amazing entrepreneur. At another level, the most outstanding crook that you could ever think of. He was both in equal measure, and his partner in crookery is a family that now owns Bennett Coleman. Okay. Uh, and Times and of India. Sorry, yeah. Okay. Father, son, son-in-law, son-in-law, his son-in-law, uh, his son-in-law, and he, and and the kind of crookery he did. He eventually was supposed to go to jail, but he didn't. He stayed in hospitals, pretending he was in jail. Uh, but the political opinion went against him. And so formally managing agencies came to an end, and Mrs. Gandhi came into power. So formally managing agencies came to an end in 1970, but if you read the book, you will see there's a wonderful French saying called plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, which means the more things change, the more they remain the same. And you will actually notice that not a single thing that managing agencies did to earn more money than dividends is not done today. And it is not unique to India. It was there in Japan, Zaibatsu, and then after that, the Kairetsu. It's there in Korea with the Chebols. It is there with Jardine in Hong Kong. It is there with Li Ka Shing. It is there throughout the Western world, barring perhaps the United States and the UK. So it is alive and well in different forms. It's legally not there. But it was the institutional form and the business organizational form that made India what it was. And that's what the book is about. And it's fun. Thank you, Ankar. So, Jerry, talk about the Kachi traders and the Golden Triangle trade. It's very interesting because we really don't know much about Kutch, right? There's a run of Kutch and there's some flamingos. Uh, in 1965, we had a new kind of world of Pakistan. And recently, they had an earthquake. That's about it. And everywhere in the map, are you there? In the, in the uh, maybe I'll go there. Yeah. Everywhere in the maps of India, it becomes like this. And Kind of ignore it. It's not on. Can you? Oh, it's not on. Use your use your hand. Okay. Button. So when Jaya Goswami, this young lady who works with Bombay University, who is herself a Kachi, decided to kind of explore Kachi merchants, Gurcharan um, requested me to kind of collaborate with her and edit the book. It's a fun book because it's an anecdotal book. Uh, and it gives all kinds of details. And one of the things, for instance, we decided to do was not to convert currencies of 200 years ago to today's. So all the quotes are kind of, you can imagine what it might be. But the interesting thing really is the point that Gurcharan made earlier 
that the Kachis demonstrate that there was an abiding and enduring Indian tradition of global capitalism well before it became formalized, institutionalized, or fashionable. So let me just read a couple, a few sentences from the introduction to give you a feel for that. The book focuses on the doings and wanderings of Kachi merchants in the 18th and 19th centuries. It restores balance to several assumptions that many of us have implicitly internalized. It established, establishes that there was a vibrant market-based capitalist tradition in remote Kutch well before Max Weber was born. Because Max Weber was the, the German sociologist who basically said that capitalism never could arise and never did arise in traditional societies like India, and he blamed caste and and so many other things for it. But that's not true. The other myth that the book kind of demolishes is that everywhere in India there was a ruler versus merchant <coughs> conflict. It's not true. In Kutch, in fact, in all the Saurashtra states, not just in Kutch, in all the West Coast states, the Divan was never a Brahmin. The Maharajas were Rajputs, and the Divans were invariably Banyas. And there was a very symbiotic relationship between merchants and the state. In fact, I mentioned in the introduction that the Kachi Jadeja Rajputs had anticipated the Laffer curve. They were very clear that they would not increase tax rates. That if you increase tax rates beyond a point, total tax revenue would drop. So they understood the elasticity of tax revenues. Um, and since some of these, they were very much like Queen Elizabeth I in England. They participated as uh, profit sharers and investors in some of the ships and voyages that the Kachi merchants uh, took, uh, you know, undertook. So many of these things that we think, hey, India was different, it was a peasant society, village society, um, uh, self-sufficient villages, there was no tradition of trade, capitalism is simply not true. It's simply not true, and that is what Chaya is able to anecdotally, because she's done a lot of research going through the books of account of Kachi traders to understanding how they built ships. Before steamships came up, by the way, Mandvi Port in Kutch was a big builder of ships. That's another thing that comes up in one of the chapters which is fascinating, how ports can go up and down. Surat was a big port of the Mughal Empire. The Tapti River silted up. And there was unrest in the country. So Surat became unsafe. Mandavi became better because the Jadeja Rajputs maintained law and order there. <coughs> and then, of course, Bombay came up and the East India Company became the dominant power on the West Coast. So you can see the decline of Surat, the rise of Manvi, the decline of Manvi, the rise, which is very similar in our own times to the decline of Aden and the rise of Dubai. I mean, Dubai was a fishing village when Aden was a mighty port 50 years ago, and today Aden is backwaters and Dubai is a mighty city. So these things happen, and they have happened through history, which comes through. The other thing that's interesting is what kind of institutions and practices the Kachi merchants had. They had money transfers, bill discounting, long-term and short-term credit, foreign exchange trading, maritime insurance. Foreign exchange trading is a very interesting story that happens when they're in Zanzibar. The French guy uh, consul tries to put pressure on the Sultan of Zanzibar to increase the exchange rate for the French franc. The Kachi merchants boycott the foreign exchange market and say that won't happen. The French franc has to trade at market rates. We're not going to allow by fiat currencies here. The other thing that it kind of questions is this caste. 
It is true, most of the Kachi traders were Memons. But not all. Some were Lohanas for um, agricultural caste. So the idea that caste somehow inhibited people from entering business or growing business is simply not, you know, there's not any empirical evidence to that. There were a group of Brahmin uh, monks called Goswamis <coughs> who were very active traders. Brahmins are prohibited from trading traditionally, at least according to the Manusmriti. But they found ways to get around the Manusmriti and they were trading. There were also bankers. The monasteries of Kutch, the Goswami monasteries, issued virtually what you would call today banknotes, promissory notes. And there was a central, the biggest monastery was the kind of central bank of Kutch. So these institutions and practices kind of have evolved and have been there in Kutch. The book covers a whole period starting with the basic decline of the Mughal Empire, early 1700s, right up into the early 20th century. The Kutchi expansion overseas is also fascinating. They went first to Oman. Oman was a Portuguese colony, and then the Portuguese lost it to the Arab tribe, the Yaribas. The Yaribas turned out to be very similar to the Jadeja Rajputs and Kutch. They were pro-business. They didn't care about Hindus. They gave, there was a Hindu neighborhood, there were Hindu temples. They were quite okay. They wanted taxes, they want merchants to flourish. So they lucked out. <laughs> and because of some marriages and some cross conquests, the Yaribas also became sultans of Zanzibar. That's the Oman Zanzibar connection. The Kachis went there too. And they got involved in ivory. Actually, they were also involved in trade in black slaves. But if you look at the records of most of their companies, that's always understated because that's something you don't want to acknowledge. But by the first half of the 19th century, the British had abolished slave trade, and they became very big in ivory. Ivory those days was exported from Zanzibar primarily to Massachusetts. So this is real globalization. This is not. In Massachusetts, there were piano companies in the s in f after the Civil War between 1865 and 1900, which used ivory for making the piano keys. And every single American middle class home, as America grew richer and richer, had a piano. So piano became a big business, and the entire ivory was supplied by Kachi traders out of Zanzibar. Now, how did they rationalize this? They were vegetarians committed to ahimsa and nonviolence to killing elephants for ivory. So they started a theory, convenient theory, that this ivory only came from dead elephants and not from <laughs> ones that have been hunted. Um, what I'm saying is this idea that somehow religious prescriptions or caste stuff inhibited is simply not the case. When they wanted to, they could find ways around it. Then in the 19th century, another fascinating trade that Kachi merchants were involved in was arms trade. The uh, Persians and the Afghans used to come down to Oman to buy their arms. And of course, the Afghans who were killing soldiers of the British East India Company, mainly Indian soldiers in Khyber and Peshawar and so on. So the British ICS officers got very mad, saying this is not correct. You know, we shouldn't be allowing this. But guess what? Belgians and French were willing to sell guns, and they came to Oman, and they got sold routed through Kachi merchants. And there is on record. That's why I like Chaya's book, because she's found some interesting little tidbits here and there. There is record of a Leeds or Liverpool-based uh, British gun factory where both the owners and the workers went on strike against British policy, saying we should be allowed to sell guns into Oman, even though they may end up killing British soldiers later. So the arms trade seems to have been very similar then as it is today. The Kachis are a kind of subgroup today among Gujaratis, but actually their language is a little distinct from Gujarati, and it's a, it's a distinct tradition. It's, it's a very hostile land, desert. There's nothing there. Agriculture is very difficult. 
but it had a great coastline. It's one of the longest coastlines, goes round and round and round, great harbors. So that's what they kind of, and as Bombay grew finally, they created a large Kachi diaspora in Bombay. So Oman, where they're still there, the Kimjis are the largest uh, trading house in, in Oman today. They're a Kachi group. Zanzibar has gone down as, as that country has gone down. Um, and Bombay, and they've continued to be part of the growth of Indian capitalism. And it's, a, it's an extraordinary story to see. There is also a subtext somewhere in the book that you should take a look at. Horse trading, Kathiawadi horses. They were one of the biggest traders of Kathiawadi horses and one of the biggest, they supplied to the Mughals, the Marathas, and the East India Company horses for fighting. East India Company paid their bills regularly, so they like to s sell to the East India Company more than to the others. All that comes true in the book. It's fascinating to see essentially what is not mainstream history, maybe by lanes, maybe forgotten places. But the question really we should ask ourselves is, why have we forgotten this? It's so vibrant, so, so fascinating. And I think Penguins and Gurcharan are doing a great job by bringing these themes into the public domain in a semi-academic and semi-popular format, which I think all of you, all of us, need to engage with to try and get rid of this Weber, Karl Marx, Euro European-centric Henry Main view that somehow India didn't have uh, a, a capitalist tradition, and of course, the post-1951, 56. You look at any Hindi movies of the 50s and 60s, the trader, the Baniya, the Lala, the Marwadi is always portrayed as an evil person, the mill owner. I mean, these, this is all recent. The celebration of Indian capitalism, I believe, is in fact been the theme, and the denigration is not something that's, that's always been the case, and maybe it's time particularly in a town like ba Bangalore, to revive that sense of celebration. Let me stop. Thank you, Javed. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, the next volume that's coming out, this came out in November. In February, we're going to have a very exciting story of the building of the Indian Railway. And it's done by, B by Bibek de Broy, who was who's now with Niti Ayog. And he was going to be part of this panel. But unfortunately, Mr. Modi called a meeting today in Delhi, and we couldn't hear that story. But the, it's coming attraction in February. Then in Ju June and July, we have a wonderful volume written by Professor Donald Davis. He's a great authority on pre-commercial Indian law, modern, pre-modern, pre-modern commercial law. And it's based on a lot on the text commentaries of the, on the Dharma Shastras. And this book is called The Dharma of Indian Business, which is very apt today. And then we have a volume coming out on the Parsis. Anyway, we have another volume coming out on trade in the Mughal period. But since we talked about Parsis, and since Omkar mentioned the Tatas, I think this is a good time to begin a short conversation about the Ratan Tata Cyrus Mistry Spat. And what does the managing agency idea throw light on the governance problems of Tatas today? Entirely, entirely. It's very straightforward, and, and I'm, I'm not taking sides. Uh, uh, I certainly won't take sides in a public domain. Um, and, I, and I have a fair understanding of what happened. So it's one has to. So tell us. No, <laughs> but but I'll tell you what the I'll tell you what it is. It's very straightforward. <coughs> Barring eighteen point five percent, which is owned by Shapuji Palamji. So the rest, roughly eighty one point uh, eighty eighty one point five percent is 
owned by two major and one minor, very minor Tata Trust. Okay, two major Tata Trust and one very minor Tata Trust of Tata Sons. And Tata Sons, in turn, owns large chunks or relatively less large chunks of different companies. TCS, it owns over 75, nearly 75 percent, 74 percent. In other companies, it varies from a low of about 22, 23 percent to about 35 percent or 40 percent. There were definite differences in way of running Tata Sons, which Cyrus was, after all, appointed by Ratan before Ratan uh, stepped down. And, but he's still the chairman of Tata Trust. He's the chairman of Tata Trust. There were definitely differences that occurred, especially in the last year, between the way Cyrus thought the businesses should be run and the way things should be done. And more importantly, and I'm not passing value judgment here, uh, there is a certain culture of Bombay House. Unless you've gone to Bombay House lots of times and known people in Bombay House over the last three, four decades, and I've been fortunate that I have, uh, there's, a, there's a clear culture. Once you enter Bombay House, you know that culture is there. That culture also defines this, the sedate pace at which the lift goes up to the fourth floor. Yeah, there's, there's some, I don't know really, I mean, the culture at one point involved a very, very large dining room where old directors used to sit and have, and, and Cyrus, like Ratan in his time, was changing the pace and in some ways, not in a way in which Ratan approved, particularly in the last one year. I think the question is a governance question, which is what you asked. Yeah, yeah. Is, is this, should trust, should trust have so much say directly on the running of the managing agency called Tata Sons, and therefore indirectly on the running of companies where Tata Sons has share ownership? And that, to me, is the governance question. Right now, it does. And it's very important to remember, there are only two trusts that are allowed to have it, Birla's and the Tata's, okay? If, for instance, today, if Azim wanted to set up a new trust, he has a trust, of course, but if Azim I wanted to set up a trust, we have to finish. Yeah, and then use that to control Wipro, that won't work, because it's not allowed. So this is an anachronism which has been sitting there and the question is not whether Ratan is right or Cyrus is right. The question is, should trust have so much say, charitable trust, and these are charitable trusts, should charitable trusts have so much say in the running of companies through holding companies? Um, we're running out of time. Uh, I would have liked to have heard your point of view on this, but let me give, have the last word because I wrote a piece for the FT a month ago in which I saw the battle between the Ratan Tata and Cyrus Mishki as a story of the, you know, that we have a saying in, in the North called Haveli ki umar saat sal. The life of a business house is 60 years. This basically means that the first generation makes the money. The second generation has the money. They don't want more money. They want power. So the second generation has a story like the Kennedy's or like the Wooden Brooks novel. I recommend that novel to all of you. It's a story of three generations of a German family by that Nobel Prize winner, Thomas Mann, Wooden Brooks. Second generation wants power. Third generation has money. They don't want more money. They have power. They don't want more power. What do they want? They want respectability, culture, art. So the grandson becomes a violinist. And the business goes phut. And that's the end of the Haveli Kilomar Satsal. 
the point here is that Tata's defied this law of 60. 148 years later, we are still talking about the Tata rule. And this has been controlled by the Tata trusts, as he was saying. So to me, this is a, a, a cautionary tale for Indian capitalism, for the Indian, in, for India Incorporated, because they've got to learn now. In America and in Europe, in many countries of Europe, you change from ownership, promoter capitalism, to managerial capitalism. So general motors, so therefore the American corporations are very widely owned. The family interests have become smaller and smaller over time. And the families realize this for the endurance of these enterprises. So in a way it goes back to the story of managing agencies also, but now we have to, Indian, this is a very important story for the future of Indian innovation. Anyway, we've come to the end. Thank you very much. I think we have room for a quick couple of questions for a small Q&A session. Uh, sir, whose questions would you like to take? Well, you the can first direct. hand in front. Yes, okay. Thank you for uh, the wonderful talks. Um, the question that comes to my mind is that it's clear that India had a very vibrant entrepreneurial and economic system in the 18th century and prior. In fact, we were one of the richest countries in the world pre-colonialism, 23% of world GDP. Now, how come our, the, the business people with all their brilliance were not able to influence the two tsunamis that came after? One was capitulation to the East India Company, and second was Nehru, Nehruvian socialism, right? Where uh, normally you find brilliant groups with economic clout also being able to preserve the system and be influential? The first was not a tsunami that affected business groups. Uh, the East India Company uh, didn't come in the way of business groups and business families prospering or growing or coming in. Nehruvian socialism, and again, you have to be very clear about this. It's very easy to browbeat Nehru, and he certainly did a lot of socialism, uh, but actual destruction and complete stifling of business was, it was his mother, was his daughter, okay? 67 onwards was the real stifling of business. You know, you wouldn't even remember. There was no reason to. You had business, li you had licenses called carry-on business license. I'll give you a simple example. My father wanted to expand a non-ferrous foundry from a non-ferrous foundry to a ferrous foundry. He had to make 42 trips to Udyog Bhavan, to the Secretariat of Industrial Approval, with 13 applications. Took two and a half years before he got that just to expand the foundry in the same yeah. space. Yeah, so I, 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 clearly Indira Gandhi was the villain, absolute villain of the destruction of the Indian commercial spirit and Indian I capitalism. Yeah. Thank you, sir, you had a question. Yeah, yeah the, yes. the gentleman in, in the front. Hi, everyone, uh, my name is Jayant Gandhi. I belong to Bhatia community. Community, okay. which is uh, <laughs> yeah. first cousins of uh, welcome. Kachi. Kachi. <laughs> uh, my father used to have uh, have the tales of uh, we also our forefathers like uh, having the same trade route. I wanted to know whether this book contains that uh, mention of Bhatias also. Yes, of course. I mean, it, it does, and and the it does. It, it's it's you you'll pick up some very interesting tidbits here. Because going abroad was a sin, many of the Bhatias came back and set up big temples in Dharamshalas and Kutch to make up for that sin. Interesting ways. I'm saying the ways they juggled these things. The Bhatias themselves wouldn't trade in hides. They, because hides, you know, uh, leather. Um, uh, and the Kachi Bori Muslims would. So they had a kind of separation of stuff. But they were still members of the same Mahajan. The chief uh, Bori uh, Kachi Muslim trader in Zanzibar, he started as an apprentice in a Hindu Bhatia firm. Uh, it, it's, uh, so you kind of, uh, I did want to respond to this young man's question on East India Company and 
the failure of that encounter, if you will, from our side. And I, it is very tentative. It's not backed by too much empirical research. I do think that while we did have a lot of successful market capitalism in India, be it in the south or uh, particularly in coastal India, mercantile India, I'm not sure we picked up on innovation. I don't think we made better firearms, we made better things. This innovation may have been yeah. where um, you know, we Jerry, lost out. Jerry is absolutely right. This young man is picking, has picked up that book, that India Unbound, where I in fact say that actually we tend to blame the British Raj. But in fact, thank you, sir, thank you. Uh, the <laughs> I, I, you'll get your commission afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> the, the British, we tend to blame the British Raj. Uh, but in fact, or East India Company, it was technological obsolescence that was responsible for the rise of Britain and the decline of it. India was the largest producer, has the largest share of textiles, and that was the driving engine of India's uh, GDP, et cetera. And it was the, it was, it was our, 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 our things were destroyed because of that. Anyway, let's get one last question. Sir, oh, there are so many, gosh, what to do? And the No, that gentleman has been waving his hand from there. Yes, sir. One of the critical problems to face our country has been the non-emergence of leaders in business, as also politics. Now, more importantly, has the how, why this there has been no leadership emerging in business and in this area? Where do you see I no leadership emerging that. in business? I disagree. I'll, I'll point out to you. No, in business. Let's if see you where you look at it. See. If you look, I'll tell you, particularly in South. Okay. If you look at it largely, it is it certain regional areas that have produced leaders or businessmen, successful businessmen. If you look at it from the point of industrialists also, it has been primarily from certain region or communities and spread over North India vis-a-vis -vis South. Likewise also in South. No, no, you had your I don't, I don't agree with you at all. I have a study. You're factually that. completely wrong. I'm we have, we have here. The empirical facts are against you. No, no, Syrian totally Christians, against you. very, very You're totally uh, against successful you. business people in Kerala. I mean, all kinds of communities. Chetiyars. No, no, uh, forget Chetiyars. Brahmins in Tamil Nadu. So there's all kinds. Sorry, you're at wrong. At the national level, I have data to show that. This your is data, a very. I don't know where data. you got it. You, you know, I think, uh, living, sir, wrong. sir, we're going to take a. Let's take this discussion we'll over chat. We'll take it offline. We'll take it offline. Okay. 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 Now I have a perfect answer. She was talking about philanthropy. Why? Now, if, if you want to listen to us, madam, you should hear us and not talk again to somebody else. The, she talked about philanthropy, and that's a wonderful way to close this session. Because in the Panchatantra, I don't even think you two know about this, but in the Panchatantra, there's a wonderful story about a merchant named Vardhamanak. Vardhamanak is a senior merchant who's giving advice to a junior merchant, to a young man, like the mouse merchant fellow. And he's saying to him, what's the secret of success? He says, first you must make money. Once you have money, then second you must know how to conserve money, because it can very easily disappear. You can't put it, you shouldn't put it under the carpet. You, the best way to conserve money is to make it grow, meaning interest or equity or something. The third, after you know how to conserve money and make money, then you must learn how to spend money. He says most people don't know how to spend money. It's more difficult to spend money than to earn it. You, have, you, you can easily splurge it or you can be very mean to it mean about it. And finally, madam, he says, you must learn to give it away. And when you give it away, give it away in a way that you are teaching someone 
to fish rather than giving him fish. He doesn't use those words. But he has captured the idea of venture capitalism and social investing. Hmm. Right, thank you so very much, gentlemen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Jerry Rao, Omkar Goswami, and Gurcharandas. Thank you once again.